Good Sunday morning. Could Republican House lawmakers subpoena Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein if he does not provide them with an on-the-record interview about reports he offered to wear a wire during meetings with President Trump? Well, the campaigner-in-chief makes the case for the GOP this midterm election, and U.S. diplomatic tensions with Turkey eased while intensifying with Saudi Arabia. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Maria Bartu Romo. Welcome to Sunday Morning Futures. It is a big week ahead for House lawmakers looking for answers after Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein decides not to testify to Congress about reports he planned to spy on the president. Rosenstein adamantly denies the claims, but not everybody is convinced. We talk with House Judiciary Committee members Jim Jordan and John Ratcliffe coming up. And the next steps to probing the DOJ and FBI actions in the run-up to the 2016 presidential election. Meanwhile, President Trump fires up the base during a rally in Kentucky last night. House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy will talk, join me talking about the state of play for keeping that chamber in Republican hands come November, as well as his bill that he just introduced to fully fund the border wall. Plus, the release of American pastor Andrew Brunson by Turkey may help repair strains with that NATO ally but now cracks emerge with Saudi Arabia after a Washington Post columnist disappears and is presumed dead. All those stories and a lot more this morning right now as we look ahead on Sunday Morning Futures. House Ju Judiciary Chairman Bob Goodlatte now threatening to subpoena Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. This as Republicans push for answers on whether Rosenstein was serious when he reportedly floated the idea of secretly recording President Trump. We have two members of the Judiciary Committee on the program this morning. Texas Congressman John Ratcliffe, a short time ago, uh, he will be joining us momentarily uh, right now. Uh, my first guest, Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan is joining me. He also sits on the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, and he is a member of the House Freedom Caucus. Congressman, it's good to have you on the program this morning. Thanks so much for joining good. us. You bet. Good to be with you this morning. I know you have a big week ahead in terms of testimonies. You've got, you, yeah. you've got Glenn Simpson was expected on Tuesday. Uh, then on Thursday, James Baker. Friday, Nellie Orr. Let's talk first about Rod Rosenstein. He was supposed yeah. to meet with Congress. What happened? He didn't show up. Look, when you're the guy who in reality is running the Justice Department and the chairman of the committee that has jurisdiction over your agency ask you to come, you are obligated to come and you are obligated to come and testify under oath. He didn't do that. So if it takes a subpoena, that's exactly what should happen. We need him to answer questions about all kinds of issues associated with the Trump-Russia investigation, but specifically the, the statement that's it's alleged that he said where he talked about actually recording the commander-in-chief of our great country and he talked about the 25th Amendment. That's specifically what I want to ask him about. Now, now, he said that he was saying it sarcastically, that it was a joke. But since he said that he didn't really mean that in a serious way, we've heard from a number of people. Kim Strassel from The Wall Street Journal did an op-ed on this uh, as yep. well. You've got John Solomon from The Hill. And in John Solomon's op-ed, which was posted last week, he writes this, um, uh, that basically this was the plan. He joined me last week on Fox Business. Business Network on the morning program, Mornings with Maria. Here's what he told us. There are three separate FBI agents, McCabe, Lisa Page, and uh, James Baker, the former FBI counsel, all who say this was a serious plot. This was not a joke. There was a real discussion in May, right after Comey was fired, about possibly taking out the president by recording him and then going to the cabinet invoking the 25th Amendment. Just think how extraordinary that is. That's a political solution, and you've got the Justice Department and FBI who are not supposed to be involved in politics having the discussion. Joke or no joke, it's a serious matter, and it's a sort of an infringement of what the Justice Department and the FBI are supposed to do. I would expect uh, Chairman Gowdy and uh, lawmakers like Mark Meadows, Jim Jordan, possibly to issue a subpoena to force this issue with uh, Rosenstein as early as uh, today or early next week. I think that's a second thing to watch in addition to the uh, uh, contempt fi uh, filing that we should see. Congressman, your take. No, exactly. He's got to come in and answer questions. Who else may have been in that room? I will tell you this, Maria. When Jim Baker was in his deposition two weeks ago and was asked about this, he was as serious as you could be in describing what he understood took place in that meeting between Andrew McCabe and Rod Rosenstein, where Mr. Rosenstein talked about actually recording the President of the United States. So he needs to come in and answer our questions. And like I said, if it takes a subpoena, that's exactly what should be issued. So you, you were in the deposition with 
with, with James Baker, the first one, and you're going to yes. be with him this upcoming Thursday. What do you want to get from James Baker this week? Well, first of all, remember who this is. This is, this is the FBI chief counsel. All kinds of things flow through him. So when he says that he believed Rod Rosenstein was serious about this, this, out, this alleged uh, uh, statement about recording the president, you got to take that with the weight that it comes with because it's the, it's the FBI chief counsel. So we're going to ask him more about that. We, our, our previous deposition was cut off early. We, go, we, we ran out of time. So we need him back in there where we're going to ask more about that specific meeting that took place and then his conversations with people who were in that meeting, how those went and who all he talked to. So the, all those things need to be asked. Well, it, you know, it's interesting because you've spoken with him already and then we know that he also met with the lawyer from the Democratic National Committee, uh, Mr. Sussman. So tell us why that's yep. important. Well, you now have so many different people communicating information to the FBI about the Russia investigation. Remember, you had Nellie Orr, who we're going to uh, interview later this week. Nellie Orr's husband, who's a top official of the DOJ, was getting information that he was passing on to the FBI. You had Glenn uh, Simpson and, and actually uh, Christopher Steele, the guy who wrote the dossier, passing information directly to the FBI. And now we know that the chief lawyer for Perkins Coie, who represented the Democrat National Committee, is giving information to the FBI chief counsel as well. So all these sources giving information to the FBI, I think it was this idea that if the more people you have talking about the big lie, which was the dossier, the more apt people are to believe it. And that's exactly the, 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 the technique and the methods they were trying to use to get people to buy into this dossier that was actually used to go spy on the other, other party's campaign. But what must be said here are the people that were giving the information to the FBI were all working for the opposition, Hillary Clinton. Bruce Orr's wife was working for the opposition. Glenn Simpson was certainly working for the op opposition. And Michael Zussman, the lawyer, Perkins Coie, was the key lawyer for the Democrat National Committee and the Clinton campaign. So that's exactly right. And yet, the document that was put together, this dossier, was what was used to go to the secret court to get a warrant to go spy on the other campaign. Well, that yeah, is never supposed to happen in this country, but it did. But the other thing is that Rod Rosenstein okayed the final FISA warrant. I mean, that, that FISA warrant to spy on Carter Page was re-upped three times, and the final one was, was, was given the green light by Rod Rosenstein. So is he a witness? Exactly. Exactly right. I mean, there's all kinds of conflicts here. We, we, we now know the story that Mr. McCabe and Mr. Rosenstein have been uh, uh, had in, in conflict and arguing about who should be recused. I think actually they're both right. Both of them should be recused from overseeing anything to do with the Mueller investigation. Uh, let me ask you about the conflicts that we're seeing between what you've heard from Andrew McCabe, who now has been uh, referred criminal for criminal charges, and Rod Rosenstein, because apparently there are conflicts in what the two say. Yeah. No, there are. No, I, exactly. And I, 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 like I said, I think both of them should be, uh, sh shouldn't be overseeing the Mueller investigation because McCabe had the conflict when, when his wife was running for office. And, of course, Rosenstein wrote the memo uh, to, that was given to the president that became the justification for firing James Comey. And one of the things Mueller is looking into is potential obstruction of justice in the firing of James Comey. So exactly right. I, I think they both should not be involved. Neither should be involved. Of course, Andy McCabe isn't right now because he's been fired. The, the, the president has said he's not going to fire Rod Rosenstein at this point. Given what you know, should he actually step down? Well, I mean, look, I've not been a big fan of Mr. Rosenstein. The, the fact is we've asked for the McCabe memos. There's been a subpoena for those. We haven't got those. We have asked to see the document that Mr. Uh, Rosenstein wrote on August 2nd, 2017, which altered the scope of the investigation that Mr. Mueller is doing. We haven't been able to see that. We've asked for specific portions of the FISA. We haven't been able to see that. We've asked for the 302s, that uh, Bruce Orr's 302s, when he had conversations with the FBI detailing what he said to Glenn Simpson and Chris Steele. We haven't seen that. And John Huber, the guy who was put in charge of the U.S. attorney to look into all this, we've not had one report from him over the last six months since he's been on the job. So take all that and then add into the fact that Rod Rosenstein was a no-show this week and Glenn Simpson's taking the fifth on Tuesday. 
That is the thing that frustrates me and more importantly, frustrates you and the media and those uh, people across this great country who want to know exactly what happened. Yeah, we're going to speak with Congressman John Ratcliffe in a few minutes. He has seen a lot of this classified information. He's going to talk to us yeah. about the implications. But you just rattled off a couple of things that need to be public. Will the president declassify these documents so that the American people can understand how they put together this narrative that Donald Trump had anything to do with Russia meddling in the U.S. election? Let, let, let's hope so. I mean, uh, a few weeks ago, the president initially said that he was going to declassify them. He altered that and said that he would now run it through the inspector general, Michael Horowitz. I hope that happens as soon as possible. I do think at some point we're going to get this information. We need to, uh, because, again, we got to get answers to these important questions that um, that go to the heart of this idea that it's supposed to be equal treatment under the law. Uh, it's supposed to be uh, the, the rule of law. And I don't think that was followed in how the FBI started and launched and ran this uh, this investigation into the president and to Russia. Well, of course, and they were overseeing two investigations. One investigation into this narrative that Donald Trump had anything to do with Russia meddling. At the same time, they were running the investigation into Hillary Clinton and her email yeah. scandal. And those two investigations were handled very differently. You said it. This is about America. This is about the rule of law. This should never have well, happened where people in power could put their finger on the scale. Congressman, will there be any accountability for all of this? Well, let's hope so. I, I actually, uh, you know, I hope in the end we get a Justice Department that will hold people accountable. But the frustrating part is this pattern. Remember, it was just a few years ago where we had Lois Lerner at the IRS target conservatives for their political beliefs. She was brought in front of Congress. She took the fifth. We had Brian Pagliano, who set up the email server for Secretary Clinton. He was called in front of Congress. He took the fifth. And now we have Glenn Simpson, mm. the guy who was paid for by the Clinton campaign, who put together this fake dossier that was used to go spy on the Trump campaign. He now is supposed to come in front of Congress Tuesday, and he's going to take the fifth as well. So this it sounds is, like they're all getting This is a dangerous it. pattern. It sounds like they're no, all getting I know, away that, with it. And that's the part that drives Americans crazy. That's this idea right. that there's now this, this double standard, one set of rules for us regular folk, but a different set if you're part of the politically connected class. And that, that, is what is, that is what is so wrong, and that's why I am bound and determined we're going to subpoena whoever we have to and get the answers and hopefully have a Justice Department who will actually prosecute, uh, prosecute people who deserve it. But there is a big if there if you hold on to the majority. Going into the midterm elections, all eyes yeah. are wondering if these investigations even continue. Because if the Democrats flip the House, we may never hear another word about these investigations. Then there's this. Some are calling it a new yeah. law in political discourse. Stay with us, Congressman. I've got to get your, your, your take on the comments okay. from some top Democrats that are raising red flags ahead of the midterm elections. Congressman Jim Jordan is with us. Stay here to react. Also ahead, Texas Congressman John Ratcliffe, as well as House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy. Big show ahead. Follow me on Twitter, at Maria Bartiromo, at Sunday Futures. Let us know what you want to hear from all of those uh, people who are coming up. We are looking ahead right now on Sunday Morning Futures. Welcome back. I'm back with Congressman Jim Jordan of both the House Judiciary and Oversight and Government Reform Committees. He's also a House Freedom Caucus member. And Congressman, as we uh, went to break just a moment ago, we talked mm -hmm. about the midterm elections. Things have gotten heated up with your detractors and the, and, and the uh, left throwing people out of restaurants, talking about, uh, you know, if you don't agree with us, there won't be any civility. Here's yeah. uh, former yeah. AG Eric Holder and uh, former presidential candidate Hillary Clinton just in the last two weeks, watch. Michelle says that, you know, when they go low, we go low. No, no. When they go low, we kick them. You cannot be civil with a political party that wants to destroy what you stand for, what you care about. That's why I believe if we are fortunate enough to win back the House and or the Senate, that's when civility can start again. But until then, the only thing that the Republicans seem to recognize and respect is strength. Congressman, this is just extraordinary. We know one of your colleagues, yeah. Steve Scalise, almost died. He got shot in the baseball uh, practice, yep. almost dead. Uh, thank God he's okay. So no civility mm -hmm. until the Democrats are back in control. Your take. 
No, they, the, the left and the Democrats have taken the most extreme positions in American history. Um, I, I said this the other day. They applaud Kaepernick when he disrespects the flag. They embrace Governor Cuomo when he says America was never that great. And they cheer on Maxine Waters when she says go out and harass anyone who supports the president. So I think this campaign, uh, Maria, is real simple. The, the extreme and radical and crazy positions the left and the Democrats are now taking versus the amazing record under the leadership of President Trump over the last 20 months. I mean, think about it. Regulations reduced, taxes cut, economy growing at 4.2 percent, unemployment its lowest in 40 years. G court, uh, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh both on the court. We're out of the Iran deal. The embassy is, in fact, in Jerusalem, and the hostages have come home from North Korea. Uh, frame it up like that, and if we do that, go run that kind of campaign, their craziness, and what's been accomplished in the last 20 months, I think we win, and we keep the majority, and they don't get to run out the clock and do all the crazy things they want to do if, in fact, they get power. So has sentiment changed post-Kavanaugh from your standpoint? What do the midterms look like right now from your standpoint? I, Will the Dems I, take I, over I, the House? Yeah, I definitely think it's helped Republicans. To see, to, for the American people to see us actually standing firm and getting done what we said we would get done. And the president has certainly done that. He's doing exactly what he promised he was going to do, what he campaigned on, and what he was elected to do. The House needs to do a better job, frankly. But if the Democrats take over, we will never get to build that border security wall that we promised the American people. We will never replace Obamacare. We will never defund Planned Parenthood. We will never reform welfare like we need to. So that's what's at stake. And I think that's exactly how we have to frame it up over the next 23 days right. and have that kind of energy and intensity. And if we do, I think we win and keep the majority. All right. We were going to uh, keep following that. Congressman, it's good to see you this morning. Thanks very much. We will be watching. You bet. Thank you. Uh, Jim Jordan joining us. House Republicans may get a crack at two key players in their investigation into the anti-Trump dossier this upcoming week. The answers they could provide and why one of the biggest players in the investigation is refusing to testify. Texas Republican Congressman, member of the House Judiciary, John Rath Cliff joins me next as we look ahead on Sunday Morning Futures. Back in a moment. Welcome back. We just heard from Congressman Jim Jordan. My next guest is one of his colleagues on the House Judiciary Committee. He also plans to question some key players in their investigation into the FBI's handling of the Russia probe, as well as the Steele dossier this week. Glenn Simpson, the co-founder of the opposition research firm, uh, Fusion GPS that helped assemble the dossier was expected to face the panel on Tuesday. He is rejecting a subpoena to testify. He says he's going to take the fifth. Well, former FBI general counsel James Baker plans to testify on Thursday of this week. Nellie Orr worked as a contractor for the firm. She is the wife of the number four executive at the Department of Justice, Bruce Orr. She's set to testify on Friday. Let me bring in Texas Republican Congressman John Ratcliffe. He sits on the House Homeland Security Committee as well as the judiciary. He is a former federal prosecutor. Congressman, it's good to see you this morning. Thanks very much for joining us. Morning, Maria. What's most important about this upcoming week? Well, as you know, uh, we did subpoena Glenn Simpson, the Fusion GPS co-founder, uh, the person who commissioned the infamous Steele dossier paid for by Hillary Clinton and the DNC. Uh, he has indicated through his lawyers that he plans to take the fifth or assert his Fifth Amendment rights against self-incrimination. The reason for that, Maria, is that Glenn Simpson had previously testified under oath to the House Intelligence Committee that he never met with Bruce Orr or discussed with Bruce Orr the Steele dossier prior to uh, the October uh, FISA application in 2016 or the 2016 presidential election. That is in direct uh, contradiction to what Bruce Orr told me under oath last month. So I'm not surprised that Glenn Simpson is uh, taking the fifth. He probably should. He's in real legal jeopardy. Very clearly someone is not telling the truth. Um, Nellie Orr, Bruce Orr's wife, um, certainly can shed some light with respect uh, to that circumstance, but we also need to find out from Nellie Orr, who was paid $40,000 by Glenn Simpson and Fusion G GPS for her work, including the work on the Steele dossier, why that fact, the fact that the wife of the number four person at the, the Department of Justice, who along with her husband had operational roles with respect to the Steele dossier, that that fact wasn't disclosed by the Department of Justice when they presented that evidence to the FISA court. So, so where is the crime then? Is it her husband or is it her? She did all of this research, uh, which was never verified, on Donald Trump and then put it in this dossier and then put it on a little thumb drive and gave it to her husband at the DOJ who wasn't even working on anything about Trump at the time. 
Well, ultimately, the questions with respect to the FISA court and the representations that were made, remember what we're talking about is the extraordinary measure of getting a warrant to spy on an American citizen. And if that was done under false pretenses with false information or false verifications, then that's violating someone's civil liberties under color of law, 42 U.S.C. 1983 violation. So that's why we need to talk to to Nellie Orr uh, and others uh, to try and determine what the FBI knew, when they knew it, what the Department of Justice knew, when they knew it, and why those representations weren't fully disclosed to the FISA court. It, it sounds like there was a group at the top of the FBI and the DOJ who frankly didn't like Donald Trump, didn't want him to be president, so they just actively tried to stop him. Well, I think that's a fair summary. Uh, you know, the same folks that prejudged Hillary Clinton's innocence, prejudged uh, Donald Trump's guilt, and the same names are the same folks uh, whose conduct is at issue with respect um, to how evidence was presented or not presented to the FISA court. You've got to explain to me how it is that somebody who uh, okay, gave the green light on the FISA warrant based on all of this unverified information. I'm talking about Rod Rosenstein, the same guy who uh, wrote a letter to have Jim Comey fired and then was upset that the president mentioned that he wrote the letter to get Comey fired. The same guy who is running the DOJ today, who has been sitting on documents that you and your colleagues have been asking for, for more information about how this all came up. This is the same individual who's overseeing the Robert Mueller investigation? Well, the reason for that, um, Maria, is that uh, Attorney General Jeff Session has not appointed a special counsel. Think about the extraordinary circumstance that you just described. The head of the FBI, Acting Director Andy McCabe, and the head of the Department of Justice with respect to the Russia investigation, Rod Rosenstein, indirect conflict with one another, each accusing the other of not telling the truth with regard to whether or not someone wanted to record the President of the United States. That's why we have uh, special counsel provisions. The FBI and the Department of Justice cannot be uh, expected to fairly investigate that matter when the heads of both of those uh, components at the Department of Justice are in direct conflict. There should be a special counsel so that we can get answers to these questions. But there was a lot of strategy going on here. There was a media leak strategy. Let's leak a lot of this unverified stuff to the media so that the media can start talking about it. And they did. Uh, there were informants involved. There was a really significant strategy here in trying to takes Donald Trump down, it appears to me, why won't the president declassify all these documents so that the American people can clearly understand what happened here, rather than having this hint of Donald Trump had anything to do with it in the zeitgeist? Well, that's a good question uh, for the president of the United States. Here's what I can tell you, Maria. All of the documents that uh, Chairman Nunes and others are seeking uh, to declassify, to have the president declassify. I have seen them, and I can tell you as a former federal prosecutor, my opinion is that um, declassifying them would not expose any national security information, uh, would not expose any sources and methods. It would expose certain folks at the Obama Justice Department and FBI um, and their actions and their uh, actions taken to conceal material facts from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Let me give you an example that may put this in context with, with, uh, without revealing anything that's classified. The underlying pretext to the entire Trump-Russia investigation, Maria, is this uh, idea that George Papadopoulos, a Trump campaign associate, had a conversation with an Australian diplomat uh, about getting Hillary Clinton's emails from the Russians. Hypothetically, if the Department of Justice and the FBI has another piece of evidence that directly refutes that, that directly contradicts that, what you would expect is for the Department of Justice to present both sides of the coin to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to evaluate the weight and sufficiency of that evidence. Instead, what happened here was Department of Justice and FBI officials in the Obama administration in October of 2016 only presented to the court the evidence that made the government's case right. to get a warrant to spy on a Trump campaign associate. Mm. Declassification would corroborate what I just related to can, you. Can Robert Mueller do this special investigation without looking at all of this? I mean, how is that investigation having any credibility if he's not actually looking at who did collude or who did uh, work with the Russians? 
that issue, uh, I would advocate for the appointment of a special counsel other than Robert Mueller to look at these uh, specific issues. Yeah, but I want to know where the Mueller investigation uh, is going. So where it's going, in my uh, informed opinion as a prosecutor, is that it's winding down. I have watched closely what's been happening, and if you look at what the special counsel's office is doing, it's staffing down. Folks that are working with the special counsel team are leaving and going back to the offices from which they were detailed. At the same time, the special counsel is outsourcing and delegating investigative matters back to component agencies or component compartments within the Department of Justice and the U.S. Attorney's office. All of that signals a winding down and is consistent with the special counsel indicating that it will accept now written answers from Donald Trump's lawyers about all matters collusion related mm. to obstruction of justice related. Right. I think at the end of the day, Maria, where we are headed here is no charges for collusion or obstruction with anyone associated with the Trump campaign, but a report from Bob Mueller outlining perhaps some questionable conduct and we'll be left arguing with our Democratic colleagues whether that rises to an impeachable offense, even if it's not criminal in nature. All right, let's take a short break. We have a lot more to cover with you, Congressman, Texas Congressman John Radcliffe. Up next on Saudi Arabia, it says it will not be threatened after President Trump warns of severe punishment if the country is responsible for the disappearance of the Washington Post columnist. Back in a minute. Welcome back. I'm back with Congressman John Ratcliffe. Uh, Congressman, uh, thanks so much for being here. We talked a lot about your week ahead, and we will be watching what takes place in these testimonies next week. Of course, you are also on the Homeland Security Committee, and I want to ask you about one of the international stories of the day. Saudi Arabia is issuing a warning this morning following uh, President Trump's threats over the missing Washington Post columnist. The Saudis say uh, the kingdom affirms its total rejection of any threats and attempts to undermine it, whether through economic sanctions, political pressure, or repeating false accusations, there is an arms deal uh, at stake here. Your thoughts on the relationship between the Saudis and the U.S. today? Well, Maria, uh, very clearly, this is a gruesome allegation um, that the Saudi government was involved uh, in the slaying or alleged slaying of uh, Mr. Khashoggi. But again, it's still just an allegation at that point. I still uh, subscribe to the theory of innocent until proven guilty. Um, and unless and until we see this incontrovertible evidence that the Turkish government says that they have, I think we should uh, certainly proceed cautiously in this area. Listen, I understand um, if it is true, we need to take some punitive action against Saudi Arabia. But cutting off ties or ending arms deals uh, with uh, an ally in the Middle East only creates a vacuum for our adversaries there. Uh, Saudi Arabia may be a tenuous ally, but they are still an ally in the most volatile region uh, in the world. And they've been an important counterweight to the actions of our true adversaries like Iran and Syria and even Russia in that region. So we need to move carefully here. I trust that um, President Trump and Secretary of State Pompeo and um, Ambassador Bolton and others will get the information they need to, to fairly evaluate this and determine what sort of diplomatic actions need to be taken against Saudi Arabia. But we need to, we need to be very careful here. Yeah, partic particularly since this is our ally up against Iran, uh, which continues uh, with, with, with its hate and, and, and terrorist uh, um, behavior. Congressman, it's good to see you this morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Maria. Congressman John Ratcliffe there. On this election day, November 6th, every American faces a simple choice. You can either vote for Democrat mob rule or you can vote for a Republican Party that stands proudly for law and order, fairness, freedom and justice. Simple as that. That was President Trump last night in Kentucky making the case for Republican candidates with uh, T-minus 23 days until Americans head to the poll. Uh, we are now in countdown mode going into the midterm elections. Joining me right now is the House Majority Leader, Kevin McCarthy. Great to see you, Congressman. Thanks very much for stopping by this morning. Well, thank you very much for having me back. So here we are, 23 days away from the midterms. Let's start there. I know you've been traveling the country, uh, trying to support your colleagues across the country in different races, as well as raising an enormous amount of money for your colleagues in the Republican Party. Give us a sentiment in terms of where you see the midterms headed. Well, I see the midterms have actually changed in the last month. The intensity level, there was an advantage on the Democratic side. But that has narrowed after viewing what the Democrats had done to Kavanaugh. 
And so I see the intensity level shifting. There is a real concern that I have, though, because Michael Bloomberg, if you watched, who recently re-registered a Democrat, he is trying to buy the Democrat nomination to run against President Trump. So he has put in $80 million to try to win the House. The president was just there in Kentucky because that's one of the first races you're going to want to watch. Andy Barr against Amy McGrath. And Amy McGrath, in her own words, this is how she describes herself, the most liberal Democrat in Kentucky. So I see this is going to be a battle because of the financial resources the Democrats have against us, but the number of our candidates are doing very well and have gotten a bump in the last couple of weeks. You know, it's interesting when you look at that because for the longest time the Democrats tried to say they were the party of the American worker. And yet when you look at the donations from individuals into the Republican Party, you are beating, you are beating the Democrats in that regard, but they've got a handful of big, deep-pocketed donors like Michael Bloomberg like a Tom Steyer. Just think the three, uh, the, the three individuals who are funding the Democratic Party. George Soros. Um, you've got Michael Bloomberg. It's not just 80 million into the House. He put another 20 million to try to win the Senate. Then Tom Steyer's. More than 120 million dollars he has spent trying to win. But his main goal is trying to impeach President Trump. He brags that his impeachment list is bigger than the NRA list. Those three individuals are trying to buy our government in this process. It's very disturbing. I, I want to get to your bill in a moment because I love the, I love the name, Build the Wall, Enforce the Law. Yeah. Uh, let, let, me, let me first, though, ask you about the important races that you're watching. You mentioned Kentucky. What other races should we be watching in terms of a close call here between Dems and Republicans? Well, the first thing you want to watch, where could the Republicans actually defeat a Democrat? I'd look in Minnesota, right there. Jim Hagerborn and Pete Stalber. He, those are two seats that Democrats currently hold that we're in a very good fight to win. Now, you also want to watch, for your viewers, where could they help in the process, this Bloomberg money coming in. It's coming a great deal into California, where they're spending $10 million on individual races. But look at the open seat in Orange County. Here's young Kim. An immigrant from South Korea, Republican, running against Gil Cisneros, who was accused earlier this year from a Democrat running for the State House of sexual harassment. Young Kim is leading right now. But we have seven seats in California where I've never seen so much money being spent of them attacking. Then you could go out to Barbara Comstock, who is still in the lead, who is, the Democrats have fought every time, but who's been such a big fighter. Then think of this. Bloomberg just sent a million dollars against Karen Handel right outside of Adla Atlanta. Huh. Karen won that big special election earlier this year with all that money being spent against her. She's one of the, f one of the hardest working freshmen and most successful legislatively we've had. Wow. And then think of this, this open seat down in Miami that is a, a highly Spanish-speaking district that Democrats thought they'd pick up easily. They nominated Donna Shalala. Remember her decades ago in the Bill Clinton administration? Yes. We have Maria Elvira Salazar, who not only speaks Spanish where Donna Shalala does not, she was a reporter on Univision and Telemundo for a number of years. She knows the community. Mm -hmm. So for those out there trying to claim something different, we need the intensity level. We have a disadvantage with money. History is against us. But we're going to beat history. Why? Look at what we've done with the economy. Yeah. Look at what we've done to the VA reforming it, rebuilding our military. Look what we've done to combat opioids, the largest comprehensive bill you have ever seen, more than $4 billion. Right. Our stop human trafficking, modern-day slavery online. Yeah, and this that, is about results versus Democrats' resistance. Yeah, results versus resistance. You've said that now a, a number of times, and, and it speaks uh, accurate. Let me ask you this, because one of the big issues is immigration. Let's take a short break, and then I want to get into the weeds in your new bill, uh, Build the Wall, Enforce the Law. We are talking this morning with the Majority Leader, Kevin McCarthy. We'll take a short break and come right back and hear about the bill he's bringing to the floor. Stay with us. Hi kids, I'm Carl and I'm a broker. President Trump's policy towards China keeps getting tougher as the world's two biggest economies face off, not just over trade, but also military and political issues. Earlier, I sat down with China's ambassador to the U.S., Sui Tian Kai, to discuss the state of relations between our two countries. Ambassador Sway, welcome to Fox News Sunday. Thank you. 
I want to start with Vice President Pence's tough comments about China last week. Here he is. When it comes to Beijing's malign influence and interference in American politics and policy, we will continue to expose it, no matter the form it takes. The vice president pulled out what he says is your economic aggression, uh, what he called your emboldened military, and what he alleges are your efforts to interfere in the U.S. midterm election. Are the U.S. and China now engaged in a new Cold War? Well, first of all, I have to say all these accusations are groundless. One of the fundamental principles in China's foreign policy is non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries. And we have been consistent in this position. We have a very good track record. You were part of a quite tough meeting with Secretary of State Pompeo in Beijing this week in which top Chinese officials said that they would take, quote, all necessary measures to safeguard your country. How far is China prepared to go in terms of standing up to the U.S.? I think it's the legitimate right of every country to defend its national interests, and China is no exception. But the talks Secretary Pompeo had in Beijing was a very good communication at such a high level between the two sides, and it's very timely. Let's unpack some of this, and let's start with the allegation of election meddling. Vice President Pence says that China is specifically targeting tariffs to hurt Republican voters, to try to turn them away from voting for Republican candidates and eventually from voting for President Trump in 2020. He says that you are putting propaganda mailers in U.S. newspapers, and this week the FBI director said that China is now the number one, the greatest counterintelligence threat that the U.S. faces. Are you engaged in trying to meddle in the election in 2018 the way the Russians did in 2016? You see, Chinese media, they are just learning from American media to use all these means to buy commercial pages from newspapers to make their views known or to cover what is happening here. This is normal practice for all the media. I want to turn to the trade war. President Trump has imposed tariffs on $250 billion of Chinese goods. Your country has responded with tariffs on $110 billion of U.S. exports. Here is President Trump on the situation. We have tremendous potential to grow incredibly when we get rid of these horrible, disgusting trade deals with China. Over the last five, six years, we've been losing 300 to 500 billion dollars a year. Billion! Now, I know you say that the U.S. started it, but at this point, whoever started it, are the U.S. and China engaged in a trade war? Well, we don't want to have any trade war with any other country, including the United States. But the fact is, through the bilateral trade between China and the United States, you know how much benefit American consumers have got over the years and how much money American companies have made from their operation in China. You have to look at the whole picture. It's important to notice who started this trade war. We never want to have a trade war, but if somebody started a trade war against us, we have to respond and defend our own interests. U.S. officials say, though, that China is not so innocent in all of this. They say that you steal intellectual property, that you force technology transfers from U.S. companies that invest in China to Chinese companies. And here is Trump trade advisor Peter Navarro talking about China. Structurally, uh, it's geared toward being the, the, the parasite of the world. Everything that it does to grow its economy uh, often comes at the expense of everybody else. Right. And just this week, a top Chinese intelligence officer was extradited back to the U.S. for allegedly trying to steal secrets from GE Aviation and other aerospace companies. I think all these accusations about how China has developed are groundless and not 
fair to the Chinese people. You see, China has 1.4 billion people. It would be hard to imagine that one-fifth of the global population could develop and prosper not by relying mainly on their own efforts, but by stealing or forcing some transfer of technology from others. That's impossible. The Chinese people are as hardworking and diligent as anybody on Earth. Are you clear who President Trump listens to on trade issues? whether it's moderates like Kudlow and Mnuchin or hardliners like Navarro? You tell me. You have confusion about this? I mean, that's obviously part of your job as the Chinese ambassador to be able to report back to Beijing who uh, has the president's uh, ear. Uh, honestly, I've been talking to ambassadors of other countries in Washington, D.C., and this is uh, also part of their problem. What? They don't know who is the final decision maker. Of course, presumably, the president will take the final decision. But who is playing what role? Sometimes it could be very confusing. There are also military tensions. A, a Chinese warship recently harassed a U.S. ship exercising freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. And the U.S. is close to approving a $330 million arms sale to Taiwan. Do you view the the U.S. ships in the South China Sea, sails to Taiwan, do you view those as U.S. provocations? First of all, I think we have to be clear what the incident took place. You were right to say it was in South China Sea. So it's at China's doorstep. It's not Chinese warships that are going to the coast of, of California or to the uh, Gulf of Mexico. It's so close to the Chinese islands and to, so close to the Chinese coast. So who is on the offensive? Who is on the defensive? This is very clear. About American arms sale to Taiwan, this is a very good example of American intervention into Chinese internal affairs. Let's talk about another flashpoint, North Korea. Does China agree with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un that any steps that he takes towards denuclearization must match by U.S. concessions on the other side? And what do you, how do you respond to allegations, even by President Trump, that China has relaxed its sanctions against North Korea and is allowing goods to flow into North Korea? China has voted in favor of all the UN Security Council resolutions about sanctions against DPRK. And we are implementing all these resolutions. You have not relaxed them? Since, as long as these resolutions are still in force, we will implement them faithfully. And do you think that the United States is right, that denuclearization has to happen first? Or do you agree with Kim that North Korea takes a step, the U.S. takes a step? I think in order to achieve our goal, we have to have a coordinated, phased, and step-by-step -step approach. But that's Kim's position. Well, this is the reality. How can you convince him to give up all the nuclear weapons without any hope that the U.S. would be uh, following a more friendly policy towards him? Finally, President Xi and President Trump will meet in Buenos Aires at the G20 summit next month in November. What do you think are the possible